Hello and welcome everybody to ICMDA webinars. I'm Dr. Peter Saunders, the Chief Executive of the International Christian Medical and Dental Association. And uh, ICMDA brings together over 80 national associations of Christian doctors and dentists around the world, representing probably about 60,000 health professionals altogether. And today on ICMDA webinars, we're privileged to have Dr. Greenall speaking to us on developing volunteer leaders, something really very much the heart of what ICMDA does. And, and John is an old friend who I, I worked with at, at uh, Christian Medical Fellowship UK in the past. So it's great to have you back. So it is really just such a pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. John Greenall today, uh, speaking on developing volunteer leaders what does it look like to develop leaders in a national parachurch movement like like the CMDAs around the world? How do we leverage the time and the talents of people who are gifted but incredibly busy with other responsibilities? We'll consider how we're going to recruit them, select them, equip them, and then lead volunteer leaders to multiply themselves for the sake of the gospel. Dr. John Greenall is a, a pediatrician. He's also the Associate Chief Executive Officer at Christian Medical Fellowship UK, which is ICMDA's UK member body. And he's had a lot of experience in developing volunteer ministry programs, developing transformational teams, and also leading training tracks and workshops on volunteer networks. And, and John, as I said, this is something that's really right at the heart of what we do around the world because many of the of the Christian medical associations do not have any paid staff and so they rely entirely on volunteers and certainly in the early stages of building a movement and of course in the later stages too it's absolutely essential so we really welcome you we look forward to hearing what you have to say and chatting afterwards thank you Thank you, Peter. Thank you for that warm welcome. And it's great to be with you all. Um, I'm calling here from a rather cold London, um, but and it's great just to be connecting with people from, from all over the world. And as Peter said, it's a real privilege to speak on this topic in very much a, a movement which is all about volunteering. And in some senses, much of what I'm going to say is not so much to perhaps exhort you to be volunteers, but rather to remind those of us who are volunteering um, of the great privilege that it is and how we can engage engage others. Um, we're just commenting that just today to make this webinar happen has, is based on the efforts of, of many people volunteering their time and their gifts uh, and their energy. So I'm just going to share my, uh, share my screen and um, we're going to consider um, how we might learn some lessons about developing uh, volunteer volunteer leaders and I've got seven lessons that uh, we've learned here in the UK um, and then there's time for a Q&A you might actually want to make some comments about some of the things you've learned in your context because we've still got lots to learn in the UK of that uh, there is no doubt so Peter's mentioned a bit about me so I'm um, associate CEO at CMF done some cross-cultural ministry training uh, work as a pediatric doctor um, and I've also worked in local church leadership as well as my work at the Christian Medical Fellowship. Uh, CMF is our national organisation. Uh, we have 5,000 members who are uh, mainly medics and nurses, including students. And we've got over uh, 80 volunteer leaders in our Catalyst Teams network, which is our local uh, local teams. We've got currently 13 uh, what we call associate volunteers who work as volunteers for between half and one day a week with us. And we've got leaders on training tracks um, and our internship program and a number of other people who volunteer their time on committees uh, and teaching and training throughout uh, throughout CMF, which is a great, a great joy. But why why this topic? Why are we talking about volunteers? If you ask me, when I hear the word volunteers, I think, hmm, not sure. What does that mean? From my experience of going around and um, talking with a lot of volunteers um, in the UK, both through church and sometimes through CMF, is that some people have expressed to me they've just felt very tired. They're very, very busy. They're involved in lots and lots of things. And some of them are saying, look, I just feel burnt out. I feel tired. Somebody once said to me, 
um, that he'd been volunteering with CMF for nearly 20 years. And he said, I've done quite a lot of things, but no one's ever asked me how I am. I thought, oh, that's interesting. Um, and I think of, oftentimes seeing frustration from, uh, from leaders, uh, church leaders about volunteers, that they don't commit, that they're unreliable, um, and so on and so on. I thought, wow, this is very interesting. And that's really what got me thinking about volunteering. And with, with uh, Dr. Peter Saunders, we began thinking more deeply about that within the life of uh, the CMF movements. And so I guess my question is, you're, as you're sitting there, you might be uh, attending because you're in, intrigued, but what brings you here? Is there perhaps an issue you've seen in your movement or in your church or your setting where you're thinking, I'd like to learn more about, more about volunteers? It's good to think about that question. What brings you here? And I'm gonna start with these seven lessons. And as uh, Peter said, I'll move through those, move through these far, far, fairly quickly. We'll provide the slides afterwards and uh, a chance for, for Q&A to clarify anything. And really the foundation of volunteering is this, what I call a willing heart. It's something that is just provides that, that, that foundation. As I look around in CMF, um, I've met many people who embody this willing heart. One example would be Sarah, who was a medical student and um, she was just there at every event that we did, it seemed. She would just be present, she would help, she would cook. Um, she was just there, faithfully serving. And over time, she got a chance to be more involved in the work of CMF um, as a volunteer with one of our associates and in due course has actually come on to staff. Um, but she embodied the heart of a volunteer. And that's something really important for today. I'd like, if you remember anything, really, it would be to go away with that, that we want the heart of a volunteer. If you're a paid member of staff, if you're a volunteer member of staff, we all want the heart of a volunteer. So sometimes, sometimes we might feel that we're desperate for help. Um, we might think, well, I need volunteers because I'm desperate. Or we might think, well, that person's not suitable really for the staff team. Um, perhaps they don't quite hit the mark to be a member of staff. So maybe they could volunteer instead. Um, I've heard a church leader say to me uh, that he sees volunteers uh, as great because they're unpaid labor. Fantastic. We don't have to pay them and we get more things done. And I just want to really uh, challenge us as we as we sometimes come with those assumptions. And I have in the past uh, around volunteering. And I want to challenge those assumptions uh, if they're there today. A wonderful quote by an American coach, a sports coach, Chuck Noll. He said, the mercenaries will always beat the draftees, but the volunteers will crush them both. That's because mercenaries are motivated by money. They're paid, they do the job, and they go home. Draftees are motivated by fear. They have to get do what they're doing because if not, there will be a consequence. But volunteers are motivated by heart and by passion. They're there because they want to be there. They're there not to receive payment or out of fear, but because they believe in what is going on. And so that comes back to this concept of willing service. Volunteering is really all about service. It's therefore a thoroughly biblical term. You won't find the word volunteer in the Bible, but I believe it's a biblical term. It's all about service. And we see this heart of sacrificial service all through scripture. We see it in the building of, of the temple where people were called to sacrificially give of their, their gold, of their time, of their gifts to the building of the temple. We see Paul use a particular Greek word that refers to a priestly sacrifice. He talks about that in Romans 12, where we're called to lay our lives down as a priestly sacrifice. He talks about that in Hebrews, where he talks about the gifts, the financial gifts being like priestly sacrifice. Um, we see that term used over and over again for, for, for financial gifts and for time and for, uh, for spiritual gifts, if you like. They are a priestly sacrifice to the Lord, given willingly. And of course, as Christians, 
that is very the very foundation of our faith is that the lord jesus christ has come and he served us willingly laid down his life and because of what he's done for us we get to serve him back as an expression of thanks to him and so thinking about those principles i would argue that we devalue our ministry if we're begging for volunteers to join us if we say we're desperate um if we say oh we just see them as unpaid labor because actually it is a wonderful privilege for people to serve god with their lives people are looking we are all looking for a way of thanking god not because we have to but because we get to and sometimes people will come to your ministry and there is a wonderful opportunity for them to thank god with their lives and we get to help them to do that and so volunteering might be described as an act of, of privileged willing and sacrificial service to god in response to what he has done for us through christ and so just a question just to linger just to, to be there for you as you mull on this think about this how much focus do you place on recognizing and developing the heart of a volunteer both in yourself but also in i've said your people so in your in your people group and those that you are serving let's ask the lord to give us eyes and ears that are open to see who he might be calling to serve alongside us so a willing heart is number one. I hope that you're still with me. I'm not talking too fast. I'll talk faster if I get excited. Uh, forgive me for that. So a willing heart. Secondly, volunteering is all about making disciples. You may recognize uh, this. It's a red London bus. We don't quite make them the same anymore. But a bus is interesting because it's very clear what is the destination we all know the feeling of getting on the wrong bus and going to the wrong place but buses have destinations and we're talking about our ministries that have a clear destination and if you like i'm going to talk about two destinations an internal inside destination and an external destination and we need to think about that with all of our ministries. We're thinking, where are we going? Is it clear to people what is our destination? Where are we going? So an external destination example might be our, our CMF mission statement. That is to unite and equip Christian doctors and nurses to do something, to live and to speak for Jesus. It's a great uh, commission um, mission. And we do that through mission, discipleship, evangelism, and being a voice in the public square. We have a destination, and that's where we're heading. It distinguishes us as a ministry from another bus, another ministry. And it helps people understand what we're doing and how they might join us. But you and I are also walking around with a sense that God is calling us individually as well to follow him. We each have a calling and a mission. We have a very general calling to be transformed into the likeness of Christ. We have a calling to join God in what he's already doing by doing the works that he has prepared in advance for us to do. And I meet medics and nurses and dentists who when I speak with them, there's something very amazing going on because God is speaking to them. God is calling them. And when we have volunteers and also our staff, that actually we, there is an internal destination that we are helping people with as well. We are helping them to be transformed into the likeness of Christ. We've had the great commission as external destination. This is the great commandment to love God and to love others. 
And at CMF, we do that through authentic community, through word-centered fellowship. We value openness and vulnerability, integrity. I want, when I have volunteers, I want to see them grow in the likeness of Christ and in all that he's doing in their lives. That is part of what we're here for. And so this is the wonderful thing when we have people who are looking to serve God with their lives and they come across our organization and they look around and they say, there are people like me here. This is an opportunity for me to be part of what God is doing to fulfill the mission of CMF and to fulfill the mission that God has called me to do. And that's very exciting. We're on mission together. And as we think about the second point, making disciples, I want to, I've been very challenged by this. And it's this, stewarding people is essential to building God's kingdom. And a lot of, uh, certainly in our, our country, in the UK, if a charity or an organisation mismanages funds, if there is um, funds that are embezzled or not used well, the response is usually very strong. This is a bad thing. A Christian organization should use the resources that God has given to it. If you are misusing a thousand pounds, ten thousand pounds, then it's a, then it's a bad thing because it is God's money, and we respond very strongly. But how do we respond to mismanaged people? I'll be honest, I, over the years, have seen many volunteers who, it seems, have been mismanaged, who are perhaps not being resourced, not being put in the right roles, have not been supported. And so a question that we sometimes ask ourselves, this is a nice question to ask, are you prepared if you were given five million euros tomorrow, perhaps for your hospital, for your organisation, for your church? Would you be prepared? Do you think that you're going to be entrusted with that amount of money or, or less or more? That God's going to entrust that to you because you have a track record of managing funds well? It's a good question for us to ask. But I want to ask us this. Are you prepared if you were given 10 amazing volunteers? Or let's, let's, let's count that down a bit. Let's do a bit of bartering um, Abraham style. What if you were given one amazing volunteer? Are you prepared to manage them well? And this is really this, what this webinar is about and what a lot of our volunteer training is about is saying, we want to be well-placed so that if God does raise up volunteers, that we will be a place where they are managed well to the glory of God. So do you have an internal as well as an external destination for your ministry? Is it clear where you're going? both externally but also in how you're developing your people and how is your stewardship of volunteers how how are you looking after the volunteers that you have and if you're faithful with them do you think that you'll be ready for more so making disciples that's our second our second one thirdly gospel partnerships gospel partnerships we are here uh, to work together for the gospel. And we see this, this is a, a phrase from Dr. Peter Saunders. <laughs> uh, we are here talking about the priesthood of all believers, not just of some believers. Sometimes it's possible to say, well, um, we're doing the ministry. Um, I'm in leadership here at CMF UK. Uh, and this is what God has called me to do. And the message can be, to people in the UK, please, can you help us? We've got the call on our lives. This is what God's calling us. Please help us to fulfill our ministry. Sometimes it can be a little bit different. Sometimes we can say the opposite. We can say, well, um, we don't have a very clear sense of, of, of calling, but God is calling you. And uh, this is a place where you can achieve all that God has called you to do. You can, this is the ultimate place to realize yourself and to be all that God has made you to be and neither of those approaches are a hundred percent wrong there is some elements of truth 
that those things can happen. We do need to have a sense of direction and calling as a ministry. We are there to help with that internal destination. But actually, this is about volunteers being capable partners. We serve God together. We're not asking for help for our ministries. We're not saying this is a place where you can be all that God's made you to be and do what you want because it's all about you feeling good. But actually, we're here to serve God together in gospel partnership. So that's number three. So these are some foundations. I hope you're still with me. Um, as I say, it's a bit cold in my room. So I am awake because it is very cold. So if it's warm in your room, make it colder. <laughs> it can certainly help. So starting with why, this is number four. We need to start with why. And uh, many of us have had uh, posters or um, adverts that we've seen that are saying, can you help us? Or we need your help, please. And I've just referred to that concept that actually um, that is not always the best way to go about uh, to go about things i've deliberately disappeared just to check the time thank you someone once said this they said need minus vision equals desperation it's when you say the need but there's not a vision for it. It's when somebody comes in my church and says, help, we desperately need workers for the children's work. We just need, we need people, please sign up. It can come across as desperation. Whereas need plus vision is inspiration. We need to say what the needs are. But when we couple that and combine it with vision, then we get something that's far more inspiring. And if you're able to uh, talk about the children's ministry and talk about the work that God is doing amongst the young people, the sheer potential that there is, the way it's a blessing to parents that they might come into the services, the way that we're seeing young people saved, the way that we're able to sow into them lessons from scripture that will last for their lives, will be hugely influential. What a great opportunity it is to serve. And there's a need. Would you serve? Need plus vision equals inspiration. And so I found it helpful to say this, and I say this to my team all the time. Don't recruit people to the task, okay? Don't just say, this is what needs to be done. Will you come and help? Instead, recruit to the vision. Paint them a picture so that they might see that the work that God has prepared in advance for them to do, that they might see this is a place where I can see that fulfilled, where I can help. The very famous quote, many of you may know it. It says this, if you want to build a ship, don't drum up the men to gather wood, divide the work and give orders. That's the task, okay? Instead, teach them to yearn, to long for the vast and endless sea. Teach them to see the vision in front of them, that that's the place to be. And we want to be out there on that vast ocean. And so we better get building a ship and we're motivated to do so. And at CMF, I'm often trying to communicate in ways that are, are trying to teach and show the vision of what we're doing. So instead of just saying we need some student workers, I might say, imagine, imagine reaching more medical students with the gospel. Imagine a, a student group in every single medical school. Imagine leaders being discipled to lead into the next generation. Imagine equipping churches to speak into the issues of health and well-being imagine reaching to your hospitals imagine there being a praying presence in every workplace every healthcare workplace in the united kingdom where every service is being prayed for by christians imagine will you be involved and our catalyst teams are our local expression of of cmf and this is a place where we're saying, look, we would love to see transformation happening in the places where we live. 
and we work every single one of them and we have 16 teams at the, at the moment uh, that have been birthed out of our push for our developing volunteers all of them led by fantastic leaders um, who are recruiting their own teams i'll just read the the, the quote out on the right but one of our associates said this i volunteer as cmf because i believe passionately that those of us working in healthcare have been challenged in our application of our christian faith in our workplace and as peter said at the beginning icmda is is full of people volunteering their time and energy and it's it's lovely to hear uh, quotes <laughs> We could we could pull up many, many quotes of people who are investing huge amounts of their time and energy and they'll tell you why. Ask them, ask somebody why they're doing it. It's wonderful to hear their answers. And so the question really at the end of this point is, can you paint a vision of your ministry? Are you able to do that? Can you do that if somebody said, what's your ministry about? What are your needs? As a challenge, start with why. We're coming into land, so we're getting towards the end. We're doing really well. So if you've got questions that you'd like to put, you can click on the Q&A button uh, at the bottom. Try and do it there, not in the chat, and then we will filter the Q&As for, for just after I finish speaking. Um, but number five, principle number five out of seven is choosing with care. We've talked about this bus, the destination, and every bus has seat there's a driver's seat my favorite seat that i got on this morning on the bus to the station is right up here the top deck at the front because i can pretend to drive i'm not a very good back street back seat driver i like to be in control <laughs> um but buses are, buses show that there are different seats there are different places and in our in our organizations and our the what what we're involved in there are many different roles and places and it's really important that we are not just taking anybody. We're not just being saying, well, we're desperate for people and maybe you should just come in. And our role as leaders, our role as we particularly look to develop volunteer leaders is to make sure we've got the right people in the right seats. And that means listening carefully. It means having our ears open. And I listen to people and I want to hear their story. I want to hear what's going on in their lives. I want to hear how God is at work. And I'm going to be ready to say, maybe this isn't the right place for you to volunteer at the moment. Maybe it's later. Maybe there's another organisation I will point you to. Because in my experience, that saves a lot of time and heartache and trouble. Because if you have the wrong person in the wrong role, it, I think you'll, we all know this. It can cause challenges for that person, for the organisation as well we want to help people discern where god is calling them is it right for them is it right for us at cmf and so i just ask some questions when we explore membership of a catalyst team i talk about faith and heart and commitment is this really going to work they may love the ministry but they may not be able to give any time realistically and i want to help them to discern that right at the beginning if possible and so my question to you there would be, are you listening to people? Are we really listening to what their heart is and what they can manage? Or are we a bit too busy just being tunnel visioned about our ministry to really listen? But we do need to have the courage as well to ask people. We have we serve, as I said, around 5000 medics and medical students, and they are busy people. They're really busy. And. Some people say to me, surely medics aren't going to do anything for you at CMF. They're really busy already. But I've found that there is dignity in asking people. If I just think, well, they're too busy, they'll never say yes. I may be wrong. Some of my most effective volunteers are the busiest people I know. And I've asked them. I've asked them and I've sometimes asked them again. And I ask people who I'm looking for people who are faithful, who are available. They were self-motivated. They initiate things. Always looking for people who are teachable. And teachable is a combination of humility and integrity. We want people with that character. And we want people who are hungry, who are passionate to grow spiritually 
and personally. And I credit to Tim Elmore, who's a, an American uh, writer on leadership for that FAITH acronym. We sometimes short it to faithful, available and teachable fat people. But that's what we're asking God and we're praying. And my experience is that when I pray, things happen. Actually, when I pray about a team or an area where we need volunteers, God often answers. It's amazing. And I need to pray more um, because he raises people up. But we're looking, as I say, we're talking about choosing with care, making sure that we've got the right people in the right seats. And so we look at these six C's, certainly that translates for English. I don't know for our Spanish and Russian translators whether it works out as six C's at all. Sorry about that. But we have, uh, I'm not going to go through in detail because we're, we're almost out of time. But we have calling. Are they called to the ministry? Do they have a Christian testimony? What's their character? Is there chemistry? Do they fit with the team, with our mission? Do they have the competence? Call it the skills, the gifts. They may have all of the above things, but this is just the wrong role for them. And I'm looking for communication because communication is so important. Communication of expectations. Communication when we're able to say, no, I can't do that. Six C's are really helpful for us in choosing with care. I'll just skip those. So I, I just wonder, as we, as we go away, you might want to think of a challenge you face with a volunteer. And perhaps if you just trace that back, sometimes I find that something actually was not quite right with the choosing process. Perhaps it was a character issue. Perhaps it was a competence issue. Are they on the right bus, let alone being in the right seat? Have a think about that. And then just to be finished, I'm just going to finish with the last two points are about investing. And we think about head, heart and hands. We want to grow our volunteers and we invite our volunteers to come to our staff training. Uh, and I do separate modules with our volunteers. We want them to grow in their knowledge. We want them to grow in their hearts as disciples and we want them to grow in their skills. I want to teach them how to speak well, how to write well, how to lead a meeting and so on depending on their role. And we have a number of different tracks and the heart of a lot of our volunteer work is developing training so that we might train people. And we do that in the UK. And I know that there are fantastic training tracks in ICMDA. And if you're volunteering, we have volunteers, I would thoroughly recommend that you send people slash encourage them to go on training tracks, to equip them uh, for the work that they're doing. So we need to invest in people. And then finally, and I will leave you with this, is we are called to multiply through a few people. You might think, oh, it's, you know, in the UK, you've got lots and lots of volunteers. How wonderful. And I would say, yeah, we have, we do have some volunteers. And I'm grateful for every one of them. But actually, I would say we are to invest in fewer people. And I believe an effective volunteer ministry is when you actually invest particularly in volunteer leaders. And they, when I talk about volunteer leaders, they are leaders who will in turn lead other volunteers. You may know many examples of that. We see this within ICMDA all the time uh, as how people are leading the training tracks as volunteers. And we want to invest in a few people. 2 Timothy 2.2, the classic passing on, uh, to faithful men who will teach others that four, you know, four generations of faithful teaching. And so when we're looking for volunteers, it's easy to think, oh, I need lots and lots. I would encourage you to invest and look for a very small number. Don't just take anybody, uh, but focus on finding enablers, those people who, who understand it's not just about what they're doing, but their role is to help others to get that vision to be disciples who make disciples. And I have found that when I, I've got, I've got a handful of those, less than 10, but they make all the difference because they will then go on and lead 10 other volunteers themselves quite easily. They multiply. And so we need to invest in these people. We need to invest relationally. I have my 3, 12 and 72, trying to be a bit like Jesus in that regard. A very small 
team of three staff. I've got 12 core volunteer leaders. Um, and then I've got around 70 odd above that, actually, who are, are led by those 12 particularly. And we use a, a mixture of formal and informal opportunities to do that. My last slide is just some resources, and we'll share some of these uh, with you. Um, there's a volunteer training series that we're currently in our third iteration with a number from ICMDA wider family. And that training is available, which expands a lot on what I've just gone over very quickly over six sessions. And then there's some examples of our training that we have run at CMF, our, our team training, our conferences. And I just want to say a big thank you to uh, Al and Wendy Newell um, and their team. Uh, it was a few years ago that uh, Dr. Peter Saunders said to me that we should go and hear what this organization had to say about volunteer ministry. And I confess I wasn't keen. I confess I thought I knew what I was doing, but I'm so grateful to the Lord for them and for, for their teaching, shaping much of what I've learned and applied. And we do need to apply this in our context. It will be different in our cultures. But I trust that some of those principles uh, are helpful to you um, in thinking about how you might develop uh, your volunteer ministry and your volunteer leaders. God bless you. Uh, I thank God for each and every one of you who is volunteering so faithfully. And I trust it's been an encouragement to you to be reminded of why you do what you do and that it's to the glory of God and for the extension of his kingdom. Thank you. Thanks very much, John. We've been listening to Dr. John Greenall, the Associate CEO of Christian Medical Fellowship UK, speaking on the subject of developing volunteer leaders. And we've now got some time for question and answer. So, uh, John, uh, some questions. First of all, uh, from Mike Chupp. Mike is the, uh, is the Chief Executive of the Christian Medical and Dental Associations in the in the US, uh, one of uh, the by far the largest of uh, ICMDA's member bodies. And, and Mike is asking, in what creative ways have you shown these extremely busy professionals appreciation for their sacrificial service? That that chilling story of the person who'd volunteered for 20 years and no one had ever asked them how they were, you know. What, what hits the bullseye on their hearts and spurs them on to greater love and good deeds? Oh, Mike, that's a great question. Thank you. And actually, I realised I didn't, I didn't talk about appreciation. Um, and I think that's very much a core part of our, what I call our investment in, in our volunteers. Um, and we, we like to say here that there are a number of ways to pay volunteers um, because actually... Um, it's not just about paying people financially, that's staff as well. But yeah, it, showing appreciation and thanks um, is so important. So just from the very the very basic level of um, thanking people in my regular communications, um, I often seek to, to thank God for them and modelling Paul's prayers of thanking God for their service and their, their heart and uh, giving thanks back to him. I will seek with my key volunteers to spend time with them. I'm not sure they... I think they appreciate it, but I think it shows um, a degree of, of, of personal care and attention that I will seek to travel to them. I just travelled up to, to Liverpool and Derby to see two of our team leaders um, and spent time with them over a meal um, and had the opportunity to thank them and I hope encourage them. Um, we do so in our, our annual gathering. We People will come in person um, and we have before they've arrived, placed in their room, a, a card just expressing personal, uh, particular thanks for what they've been doing and a small gift. Um, I'll we'll send them, a, uh, I remember their birthdays, uh, send them a card, Christmas as well. Um, and just small things like that, remembering their, some details about their family um, and uh, committing to pray for them, both for their family circumstances and also for their, for their work. I, I'm not a very creative person, so I, I noticed your your use of that. Um, so that's as that's a number of the things that that we do here. Um, and I actually uh, we are looking to do a, a, a sit down meal celebration for all of our volunteers in the summertime, um, which is what I hope to do. But yeah, I just affirm that, and there'll be many of you who could do this far more creatively and better than I have. But that appreciation and affirmation of our volunteers is a wonderful way to express our thanks and uh, show them the appreciation of others as well. So thank you, Mike. 
Thanks, John. From, from Jenny Ellis, just in terms of managing them, uh, she says, who is responsible for the stewardship of church or parachurch volunteers? You talked about mm -hmm. uh, the importance of stewarding volunteers, more important even in the way we steward money. But uh, yeah. is it the leadership and paid staff or is it other members of the church organization? Is it other volunteers? Does it depend? Yeah. It's a great question. Um, I, I'm sure it's both. Um, I think certainly our board are, are very focused on um, stewardship of our finances uh, and also of our staff. And so actually that's been something that we have um, gradually been seeking to work into uh, the workings of our board um, that are, um, yeah, that are appropriate and that, that pertain to volunteers particularly. So I'm encouraging our board to be thinking about that. That, For example, in our, our risk register, which is, uh, and we have a number of new sections which are just recognising that we have volunteers who are using our IT systems um, and who may be affected by, by certain things. Um, and it does bring up a number of complexities uh, at that governance level of how we steward people well and protect them and give them the resources that they need. Um, it does, it, it can be complex and challenging. Um, and so it's definitely at a board level. Uh, at a management level, um, I think actually, you know, we, we are obviously equally responsible for the, the money that's spent and it's spent well. Um, but on a day-to-day -day level, it's much more about the staff or I have volunteers who lead other volunteer leaders. And that's that's having somebody, which in our situation is me, but having somebody whose role that is to be thinking that question all the time how are we doing that well is I think very valuable because it's something that can get get lost when everything is very busy and we're doing more and more things that stewarding of people can get lost because it takes time it's not always measurable it's hard to show the the benefits of it um more, more difficult than it is for numbers but it needs somebody who's a champion who can who can encourage everybody to be involved in stewarding them well so thank you for the question Thanks. Thanks, John. A question here from Emmanuel Jarbo, who's picking up on your description of mercenaries and draftees. You, you were talking about mercenaries are motivated by money, draftees are motivated by fear, but volunteers are motivated by passion. And uh, sometimes an obstruction to, uh, to raising a good volunteer ministry is that the volunteers aren't allowed to do, to do stuff. Um, okay. by by people who may feel that they're the only one. So his question is about the people who discourage people wanting to volunteer, in particularly in their own work domain, because they feel that only they are able to do the work properly or, or perfectly. So I guess mm. that's a wider question about delegation as well. But but how do you how do you facilitate the kind of empowering of volunteers yeah. that is going to, you know, uh, expand the ministry and uh, yeah. deal with those who are perhaps not happy about volunteer ministry, who yeah, might well, even be on your staff, of course. Yeah, I'll be honest. I've, I've worked with people who have said, look, volu managing volunteers is hard work. It's not worth it. It's um, And so I, I found that there's a couple of ways that I've done that. What, one is by sharing this vision about volunteering and what it could be like with them i want them to to hear it and to be excited by the potential and then we'll also do some exercises because i want to hear understand that better and so we'll, we'll do an exercise for example what do we expect from our volunteers uh, and then i will ask people you know what's been your experience and try and understand where that problem has come from is it because they've lacked a vision for it is it because they've written them off really straight away is it because they're not resourced very well is it because our lines of communication are poor and i would equally be asking um the uh, volunteers themselves what do you need from staff uh, and hearing what it is that they appreciate and that's things like appreciation and they want to hear clear communication things like that so i i found that just spending time unpicking these issues and Try, you know, I try to understand better where people's reluctance comes from. But ultimately, as we shape the culture of an organization, I want CMF to be a place 
where volunteers are welcomed. And if a new staff member comes on board, it's part of their, we've rewritten role descriptions to include that your ministry is about working through volunteers. And we want you to come in recognizing that is part of your role is to work with and through volunteers. Are you okay with that? Because that's what we do here. That's our culture. So those are some of the things that we do, but it's a good question. And it happens in the UK. I think it happens everywhere. H Howard Lyons is asking, uh, is there any difference in the way you manage volunteers compared with how you manage paid staff? Mm. Uh, I, I guess in terms of expectations, tasks, accountability, deadlines, all of, mm. all of those sorts of things. I think a lot of us feel reluctant to to uh, hold volunteers accountable because we feel whether we're not paying them what right do we really have to to uh, ask them to make a big contribution but um mm -hmm. is there a difference in the way you manage staff and volunteers so the main difference i would say is that there aren't many uh, a big difference is i ask for certain time commitment so for us uh, for a big leadership role i would ask for two years for um a less sizable role i will ask for one year minimum and so we have a review so i will review them every year formally with a you know they will fill in some paperwork and i will fill mine in but at that point there is that question do you feel able to continue for another year so there is a uh, that that's to some degree we may ask that with staff but i think often with staff uh, we're hoping in most of the situations for a longer term commitment. So I think I recognise with volunteers that they will often not be able to commit to a longer term commitment because life changes. But actually, many of our volunteers do stay on if they feel it's the right place and they're well suited and being looked after. So I think time time commitments are, are one key area. Um, and clearly, we're not holding them accountable for um, the use of, of financial resources because I would see that as a, a staff as a staff role. They will they will be spending some money, like setting up conferences, but I'm not expecting them to oversee or report back about the financial aspects of what they're doing. But other than that, Howard, I, I, my, the bar is very high for me, um, and I think a lot of people are very nervous about that because we're dealing with very busy people. And yeah, what right do I have? But I go right back to the agreements where the expectations are laid out very early on. And I ask people to make a, a, a high commitment for a period of time. And I manage them very similarly to staff other than that. Yeah. You uh, came out, John, quite early with the, the Chuck Knoll quote about um, the mercenaries and the and the draftees, the mercenaries will will beat the draftees, but the volunteers will truck uh, crush them both. Yeah. And it's a question here about how do you deal with instances of misconduct or underperformance of volunteers compared yeah. with employees who have contracts, salaries, HR procedures, and so on? Do you have contracts, job descriptions? HR procedures and so on that apply to volunteers and, and how do those if so how do those differ from what you do with staff you know thank you for the question yeah so when people come on board there is a when they're brought on they are um obviously they will they will fill in application forms but they will also sign things like our data protection policy our doctrinal basis their policy so they're agreeing to abide by our, our doctrinal basis theologically they're agreeing around our data protection um, they are agreeing to our, our code of, of conduct, safeguard, you know, our safeguarding policy, um, which we updated last year. Um, and so we we do expect them to adhere to those things. Um, and of course, when you've got people who are leading people and leading Bible studies and uh, speaking into people's lives and they're, they're spread around the country, it means that we have to have, um, they need to be closely supervised and monitored um, should anything go wrong. Um, and I need to be able to look back if I go and I have had to do this a couple of times, meet with somebody and say, well, actually, um, yeah, this this is well, there's been a number of people who have said some things about about your your work and um, we need to talk about that. And then I will refer them back to what they've agreed to do. Uh, and if it's not working, 
actually agree that they should stop volunteering with us, which is a very sad thing to do. Um, but you're right, we don't have, we have to be careful bringing people on and giving them significant roles. And that's why the back to my question, my point about staff is I do manage them fairly similarly to staff. Uh, because actually for these high level volunteers, uh, they are doing significant work and they need that level of accountability and protection as well um, for what they're doing. Um, so they have, you know, they'll have a CMF email address and we include them on our systems and we want their community, we want to be able to see what they've communicated in the future, should there be an allegation, for example. Um, so yeah, good question. And it's something to think about carefully. Thanks. Uh, Angel Wang is asking from uh, from Burkina Faso, uh, West Africa. Um, how do we help people to develop from being people who are just asking for help on the one hand into people who are able, if you like, to help themselves and then help others? So I, I think it, it's getting people from a position of dependence into a position of service perhaps? Well, that's a great question. If you've got the answer, um, let me know. I mean, I think <laughs> there'll be others who are better qualified to answer that than me. I mean, I, I found that um, I'm, yeah, I'm often praying that people would um, would see that they, they're in a position to, to serve others. Um, I think certainly in our, I have a lot of church leadership friends who uh, sometimes look on and say, I'm a bit jealous because you've got all of these medics who are used to being helpers who are used to taking positions of responsibility and they'll come and they'll serve with you and actually they'll say in my church I've got lots of people who are very dependent and are used to other people solving their problems um, and I think that takes that takes time it takes discipleship it takes uh, calling people scripturally to maturity in Christ um, and to then taking on the responsibilities um, that God is placing before them and that that's everything from parenting to um to service um so this is a this is a maturity discipleship issue uh, uh, fundamentally um and if it's because some people are nervous and they say well i you know i i can't help or whatever it's because they haven't got the skills or they don't think they've got the skills then we need to help them with the skills gap and encourage them that actually you can help others you can serve other people mm. John, you, you talked about, uh, use the analogy of the bus and, and saying you don't only need the right people on the bus and not too many of them, but they need to be sitting in the right seats on the bus as well, doing, doing roles that are, are suitable for their, for their gifts and their passions and their, and their, their callings mm -hmm. and so on. I, I think a, a big temptation in building a volunteer ministry is to say, well, what are our needs? This is what they are. Where's the person? <laughs> Who can we put in that place without really tailoring the the yeah. person matching the person to the need? So, just a a, a bit of wisdom about um, how you go about getting the right people in the right places in your yeah. team. Yeah, thank you. Good question. Uh, and it and oftentimes we're not overrun with volunteers you know that we i think of many of us feel that we think well if i get one volunteer i'll be you know be be fortunate and i think for me it's um i'm very maybe my personality but i'm ready to say no and leave something and, and say no it's not the right time we need we need the right person and we're going to wait and that can be really hard because it can mean a whole area of ministry that has to pause can be really hard for us if we haven't got a regional team leader or one of our catalyst teams and i'm in that situation at this very moment where somebody said oh i'm happy to lead it and i've actually very difficult but actually had the conversation where i've said I've said no but i've said it in a different way i said actually i think you're better suited to just focusing on junior doctors uh, and i've tried to explain why i've tried to explain that i think this is the best way and that and so on and so on but i think holding off but equally not waiting for perfection and realizing that my idea of great leadership in this area is not always the idea and so i'm saying lord is this person teachable do they have the character are they somebody who could learn and if they are then i can say well okay i think we can we can work with this but we are going to have a review date clearly to see how it's going both for cmf and for them 
Yes, uh, indeed. Uh, well, sadly, uh, John, we've run out of time. Uh, there's just been a couple of questions here. Yolanda Melendez is saying, can you send us an example of questions we can include in an application form? And we'll make sure yeah. in the letter we send out, we'll, uh, we'll get one from John uh, that you can adapt for, yeah. for volunteer selection. And also, uh, Imelda from Zimbabwe is asking, uh, is there a course she can do? And uh, I know you're running a volunteer training track uh, for ICMDA mm -hmm. at the moment with people. I, I think the current one is full up, but there'll be more in yeah. the future there. Yeah. And so have a look at the training, the training tracks on the ICMDA website about that as well. And of course, because John, I know you're very much about developing and empowering people and duplicating your yourself so uh, people have been through your training on volunteering who are spread right across the world in icmda uh, should mm. be able to help you as well amelda in in terms of developing uh, along those those lines so john uh, thanks so much for for joining us uh you're a busy person we're, we're really grateful to have your time and to learn from your experience and uh, teaching and particularly example, uh, just seeing what has happened in CMF has just been so incredibly encouraging. And, and I know that you have a real passion to, to see people grow and develop. And uh, we're seeing the fruit of that. And uh, for all of you for coming along today and participating for your questions, your, your comment, your involvement, do spread the word. We'll be writing tomorrow to all of you We'll send you a link to the, the video, the YouTube uh, uh, connection, and also a whole lot of resources that have been mentioned that you can make use of. And it will be up available on our website as well. So make use of all the past uh, webinars in your, in your small groups. There's a lot of gold out there. We're going to be back next week again. Uh, same time, same place, 2 p.m. Uh, Greenwich Mean Time, UTC on Thursday, the 26th of January. And we've got Dr. Trevor Stammers back again, uh, talking to the intriguing title of Organs from the Dead. And that's uh, gonna be looking at the question of transplantation, the needs uh, and ethical approaches to dealing with it. And so uh, thanks, thanks again. Uh, we'll see you again soon on ICMDA webinars. Uh, God bless you.